curve fitting to polynomials, as well as interpolation and extrapolation. We're going to move away from fitting functions to noisy measured data and talk now about exact fits. And we're going to be fitting polynomials because a line is really a special case of a polynomial. Then we will use that to do interpolation and extrapolation. Fitting polynomials. So let's say we have an nth order polynomial. So the highest power of x is n. Now let's count the number of coefficients it takes to do this curve fit. Well, we have one, two, three, four, all the way up to n, but we also have this a sub zero. So we have actually n plus one coefficients to find. So in order to fit an nth polynomial to a set of measured data, we need n plus one points to calculate them exactly. So what we'll do for each one of our measured points, we write this polynomial. And so we'll have the same number of equations here as we have unknowns. So we don't have to do a best fit or anything like that. This will be a nice exact solution. Also notice, we don't have to add residual terms here. That's because we're doing an exact fit. And so the residual terms really are zero. There is no noise here. The function that we fit will pass exactly through the lines or the points that we've measured. Given this large set of equations, we can write them in matrix form. So we have this first column vector that's containing all of the y values, if you will, all of our function values. The last column vector over here contains all of the polynomial coefficients. And in this big matrix here, it's essentially containing all of the coordinates of our points. We notice we have a column of all ones. This next column is our coordinates. The next column is our coordinates squared cube to the fourth, all the way up to the nth power. But essentially these columns are uniform in terms of the exponent that we're raising their coordinates to. We can write this a bit more compactly, this column vector containing all of the function values, we'll call f. Our column vector containing all the polynomial coefficients, we'll call a. And then of course this big square matrix containing all of our coordinates with various powers in each column, we'll call that capital X. Just as an aside, this matrix X is actually called a Vandermond matrix, and it's very known for being ill-conditioned for large matrices. And by large matrices, we're talking maybe 100 by 100 or larger than that. When we're fitting polynomials, we're going to have very small matrices. And so in this course, we'll never encounter a problem. But if off on your own, you're ever using large matrices of that form, you will have some problems and I'm just pointing you to something called Lagrange interpolation to help fix that. Won't be a problem here for us because this matrix will be very small for us. So given our matrix equation, we can solve this. We'll solve it for our polynomial coefficients. It's X inverse times our function values. And then we can read off all the polynomial coefficients and we've done our fit. And that's really it. We build the X matrix. We put our function values in a column vector, we do the backward divide, and here we are at our polynomial coefficients. So here's an example. Let's say we have these three points. We're showing those in red. So the y values, if you will, are over here. Those are our function values, and the x values are inside of the parentheses. So we would like to fit a polynomial that passes exactly through those lines. Well, what order polynomials should we use? Well, we have three points. That means we can do up to a quadratic polynomial. So that's what we'll proceed with here. So we write our polynomial at each of our three given points. This set of equations we can cast into matrix form. Now in practice, we wouldn't actually write these polynomial coefficients. We're going to look at this matrix and the form of it and just build this X matrix directly. Real easy to put these function values in a column vector, little bit of work to do to build this X matrix. And then given that we can solve for our polynomial coefficients. Throwing in the numbers that we have, here's our function values. We all have, we have ones in this first column of the X matrix. Here's our X coordinates and here's our X coordinates squared. 
So we're ready to solve for our polynomial coefficients. And that's our next step. When we do that, here's what we get. So we get zero for our A0 coefficient. We get 1.45 for our A1 coefficient and negative 0 0.3 for our A2 coefficient. Now, if we plot this, here's the function, our second order polynomial that we found, and there is no A0 because that's zero. And if we plot that, we do see our polynomial passes exactly through those points. And if we found that it didn't do that, well, we've goofed, we've done something wrong. So it's very easy to fit polynomials to a set of points. Interpolation and extrapolation. So what is interpolation and extrapolation? Well, interpolation is when we have a bunch of measured points and we would like to know the value at some other point inside of our measured points. Extrapolation is really the exact same thing with one difference. The new point that we're interested in falls outside of our set of measured data points. So to a computer, these are really the same thing. We're going to do a curve fit and we'll use that curve fit to predict a value. Whether that value is inside or outside, our computer doesn't care. It's just us that wants to overcomplicate things and give things a different name. But algorithmically, it's the same process. Why on earth would we want to do this? Well, those measurements could be difficult, expensive, time consuming, or impossible. And here's something that's reality. Suppose each measurement takes one week and 20,000 US dollars. Well, that's pretty good incentive to not repeat measurements if you don't have to. In fact, we would probably do a very minimal set of measurements to basically resolve some kind of trend, do a curve fit and use that to calculate anything else. And that's normally the way it goes. Sometimes we're running a simulation instead of having a function and each one of those points could take hours or days to calculate. So rather than have to calculate new points, we will interpolate. So how this is done, it's actually really easy. The first thing is we fit data to a curve. Once we have an equation for the curve, we can use that to calculate values at any other point. Now, clearly the closer we are to the center of our measured values, the more accurate that estimate will be. The farther we get outside or even near the edge, the less accurate that'll be. And if we get really far away, extrapolate super far away, yeah, I wouldn't trust that at all. Linear interpolation. So we start off with two points. And let's say the real curve is something like this. We don't even know what that is. Maybe that's a polynomial. Maybe that's something else. That's our real curve. If we're fitting that to a line, we're going to assume, at least in the vicinity of these points, that our function actually looks like a straight line, which of course is not correct. That will introduce some error. But this is what we'll use to interpolate values in between. So the first thing, we had two points, uh, x1, y1, x2, y2. So we'll call this point two and point one. Well, we have the equation for a line given two points. This is our equation for a line. And this expression here is slope. Now we would like to use that equation for a line to interpolate a point somewhere in between. We're calling this x sub i and y sub i. So really, we're just replacing this y with y sub i and this x with x sub i. And the only other change, we took this minus y1 and brought that over to the right-hand side of the equation. And we end up here. So using this equation, we can interpolate points between these two along this line. However, we see that there is some error introduced since we fit to a line. And this is not fixable as long as we're fitting to a line. What we would have to do then is not fit to a line, but fit to a polynomial. And that's what's next. Polynomial interpolation. So this is actually much more common because it's more accurate than the straight line, because it's quite rare in, in science that we have anything that fits straight lines. Uh, much more, it's curves. And polynomial can fit a wide variety of curves. And the closer those points, the better that polynomial can approximate that curve, even when that curve itself is not a polynomial. So if we want a second order polynomial, we need at least three points. 
So then what do we do? Well, we jump straight to our matrix equation. We understand that behind this, we've written our polynomial and all of our measured points, and we've cast that into matrix form. But with practice, we're able to jump straight to here. We have a column vector of our function values, and then we have this X matrix, whose first column is all ones, second column is all our coordinate values, third column is all our coordinate values squared, and if we had more points, we would cube and fourth and fifth and, and so on. So we can just build those directly and solve for the polynomial coefficients. So that's what we do. We bring this X matrix over to the other side. So we are pre-dividing by F. And if we have too much time on our hands, we can do this by hand and actually get a symbolic answer. And that's big and ugly. But textbooks love to do this kind of thing. And now we actually have expressions for A0, A1, A2. For example, A0 is this expression times F1 plus this expression times F2 plus this third expression times F3. And we can repeat that process for A0, A1, and A2. And that's what I show on the next slide. And you'll see this in a lot of textbooks. I will mention, I don't think anybody actually does this. Uh, this is just done for textbooks to have big, fancy, difficult looking equations, I think. Instead, I just do the matrices. And in my MATLAB code or whatever language I'm using, I would just do the matrix division and have my polynomial coefficients and never enter something like this. So maybe some people do this, but I don't. Let's give an example. Let's do quadratic interpolation. So let's say we have three points and I would like to interpolate the value at x equals three. And why am I saying interpolate? Because we have data from zero up to 4.0. So x equals three falls within this range. So we are interpolating, not extrapolating. Well, we already actually fit these three points to a polynomial. So we will reuse those results and we'll use this now by plugging in x equals three, figuring out what that value is, and that's an interpolation. So when we do that, we evaluate x equals three, we get a value of 1.65. And so if we were to plot that, we come over to x equals three, function value of 1.65, that falls exactly on our polynomial, which we hope that it would. And so we have interpolated a point. Suppose we would like to extrapolate a point. The process is exactly the same. In fact, the algorithm doesn't know or care whether we're doing interpolation or extrapolation. We are fitting a polynomial to a bunch of points and then using that to calculate at a new value of X. So we have X equals minus 0.5. This falls outside of our range of zero to four. So that is extrapolation. We've already fit that to a polynomial. We will reuse those results. We simply plug in a value of minus 0.5 and we get a function value of minus 0.8. And if we plot that, that's right here. And it sure does fall exactly on this polynomial. And we are extrapolating because it falls outside. 